Thank you. <laughs> so we'll try the demo. Probably not making news. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good. I thought people just be out planting fields, you know. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. When I was coming back from Salt Lake yesterday, I was like, what was it? 54 degrees or something down there? I was like, that's horrible. Oh no, I don't believe that's it. That's crazy. <laughs> We're going to get that Mother Nature's well, There's no snow down there. I still, I, got, I live in Collinston. I still yeah. got this much snow at my yeah, house. Yeah, it's got but... snow, but. No snow at all down there. It's warm. It's crazy. Well, I don't think spring's coming yet. It's still January. Still yeah, January. I I... a little premature. To... <laughs> you never know. It was like April snow. Really. Was it? In fact, I got a video of the trees raining. Oh, oh. Uh, that's it's what I. just pouring off of them. We we'll go right from the warmest yeah, we've ever had to the coldest. <laughs> Copenhagen base, oh, Midnight Mountain area. Oh. My husband so, so It was like a, a lot of snow, though, right? a lot of. Josh, well, you got to do something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, and I haven't lived in Cache Valley for five years, but in the good old days, when all the Good old inversion was there. If you just go up in the mountains, it was 15 degrees warmer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Today is kind of one of those days. That's how if we were shedding all the layers we could get off. We <laughs> <laughs> were packing snow and tunnels and everything else. Mm -hmm. oh, going down. Gonna start five minutes late today. So snow back pretty much settled down on the avalanche danger a couple of weeks ago. Or? Yeah, we can see you know lots of places where that where it avalanche, but okay. uh, we were trying to check. We tried to pick a kind of shaded area, and he got my son took his probe out and he got about 180 centimeters. That was total depth. No way. Didn't feel anything rotten underneath or that sugary layer. So, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Make a hand out and no one come. And then we <laughs> stayed home. It's because I touted how great of attendance we've had. <laughs> yeah. So, the 80, 180 was uh, about 8,400 feet. No good elevation. So, it's like overall snowpack in the basin is still above normal. I guess we seem to, but it maybe. seems like just it seems in the low for the end of January. Yeah. Even though you, you read this, the report, the snow tell, yeah, <laughs> but it seems really low. Hmm. There's a bunch of moisture moving in, I saw for the weekend or next week. I don't know. Rain slash snow, but <laughs> half an inch of rain in the valley. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be good snow in the mountain. <laughs> so that'll be good. Long I read something about long term climate, and it said for our region, northern Utah, the Bear River watershed, precipitation was increased, but not a snowpack. Is right. that right? And then temperatures yeah, that, higher. That's one model. So that <laughs> kind of the model that shows that that it, that will get a little more moisture, but it'll be more rain, a little less snow. Yeah, that kind of because that there's others that show it a little the other way. There's some that show it won't really change. So how have those worked in the past? It, they have they, right. They, yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll change next year. <laughs> so, plan, that plan for all scenarios, and it'll be okay. Isn't that James? Like. Tea. There hasn't been one in the past that kind of got it right. Well, you can pick one because oh. they do, you know, hundreds of them. Oh, yeah. And so you pick which line or one which guy is got most it right. Likely, uh, maybe. So one of those was probably right. Well, but how are you? Maybe nice. not have been the one everyone looked at. <laughs> like when the hurricanes come in, they have all these different models. And yeah, the where one. it could hit. What you do you do? One you want. And that's only a day out, right? Yeah. And yeah. it generally misses a little. Yeah. So if we're trying to project 40 years out, <laughs> Okay, thank you for um, attending today. Who do we have online? More, hold on. Speak. <laughs> we have online 
Yes, Todd, Mark, and Sean is with us and online. Okay. And okay, we have Melissa, Jesse, Bradley, Jeff, and Tom. Well, hello and welcome to those in person and virtual. Um, started a little late so we could get everybody here. Um, Sean, our secretary, by the way, so nice to have the secretary, would like us to do uh, brief introductions. So we'll start here, go around the table, and then hit online as well. Okay. Uh, Skylar Buck, water rights. Megan Doyle, also water rights. Jim Dorito, Trout Unlimited. Sorry, what was your name? Jim Dorito, Trout Unlimited. Yeah. D E R I T O. Mark Scadden, Bear Lake Watch. Nathan Dabbs, Cash Water District. Kurt Lindley, Cash Water District. And Hyde and Redmond, and Hyde and Redmond. Regan Holmgren. Uh, Favorite account. Yeah, yeah, you can go with that. That'd be good. Val J. Rigby. Uh, Newton Water Users and Farm Bureau Rail. Stephen Griffin, Newton Water Users. Jenny, go ahead. Jenny, I work with the Langdon Group. Carl Mackley, um, Bear River Water Conservancy District. Christy Hansen, Nord Park Irrigation and Cash Highline Water Association. Online, so you choose who goes. Oh, oh okay. sorry, we're just no, gonna get that, Sean. That, that, okay, yeah. Sean, the guy that doesn't know names of faces just yet. So, yeah. thank you for your patience. Uh, Trevor Nelson, Bear River Canal Company. Awesome. Um, we'll start with Claudia here in my top corner. You wave. Oh, she wave. Okay, <laughs> Todd, you're next. You know, Todd Stoney, Utah Division of Water Resources. Pleased to be with you today. Hey, Tom. Oh, what's that? Sorry. Tom Mard, Division of Water Resources. We'll go to Jeff. I'm Jeff Ostermiller with the Division of Water Quality. Melissa. Melissa Early, Division of Wildlife Resources, and I'm in the habitat section. Laura. Hi, everyone. Laura Vernon with the Division of Water Resources. I see you have basin plan on your agenda. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them today. Mark? Mark Hurd with the Hyde Park Canal Company and also with Cache County Council. Um, some people moved around. Sorry if we did you already. Jeff? Yeah, okay. yeah Jeff. Austin. Jesse? Okay, well, and then Bradley. Bradley Perry for the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. I can come in and wait. Okay. I think that's everyone online. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, also wanted to thank those who responded to the letter um, of notice that I sent to Laura Vernon. Um, and those who helped me get that in, I'm not familiar with comment periods, so. That was good to get that submitted. Um, we will turn the time over to Nate for right along. Yeah. So update on the state watershed council. So we had uh, that meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, I believe there were three new watersheds accepted them if they're plans. And so I, I believe there are now state eight of the statewide councils that are up and running. Um, and a couple of those others are working on it. They're, they're waiting on some possible changes to legislation for the Great Salt Lake Watershed Council makeup and that that may end up be moving over to the Great Salt Lake Task Force, may become the Great Advisory Salt Council or the Task Force? Uh, the Advisory Council, yeah. Geez, yeah. Um, they're kind of They'll add some more members to that from all the other watershed councils potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but whether that goes through or not, we'll see. I, I haven't seen 
Have you seen the draft on that, Trevor, come out? No. So the insight on that is, is that they're not going to add any new members. And so that's problematic because right. the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council doesn't include any outside of those that are designated in that that group. And certainly there are county representatives, um, but they're only the counties that touch the physical yep. Great Salt Lake. So you don't have Cash, Rich, Wasatch, uh, Morgan, uh, Utah, Juab. Summit. Yeah, mm -hmm. Summit. And so that's problematic. I mean, the other problem too is that although we love county commissioners, um, they typically don't run water systems and the Great Salt Lake is a water issue. And so if they don't change anything, our representation is individuals who are not necessarily accustomed with the needs of the watersheds and it's an incomplete list. So uh, if they force that issue, it, it could be very bad for us and the fact that we won't have any representation on that group. Um, if they decide to just leave it alone and there end up being parallel groups, that's unfortunate. But at the same time, um, they have different purposes. So we'll see what happens. I mean, the best thing would be to increase the members and essentially add one person from each of the councils okay. and then merge it with the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council and probably remove the county representatives or they'll have to add all the other counties. Yeah. Either way is acceptable, but then you get a large it's council really that gets it's out already, of hand. Yeah, and because and, at this meeting, at least, they were talking about modeling it similar to what the Jordan River Advisory Council did. So they they merged into one. They're adding a few new members so that they meet all that criteria. Yeah. Um, and that was the talk of how they would try to do this one to account for that, having that representation. But if they're looking the other way, then it's, as that comes out, I would think as a Bear River Watershed Council, we would want to speak out against any legislation that would leave that membership the same as the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council and not include those members of those counties uh, or other watershed councils that wouldn't be represented there. Yeah. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And they did they did just appoint uh, Tim Hawks as a new member of that uh, maybe Friday or Thursday last week with Don Leonard retiring off the Great Salt Lake Advisory. Yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. I knew it was on a lot of those agendas. I see a lot of legislative agendas meetings. But yeah, so there was one switch there. But yeah, so we'll want to watch for that. So if anyone sees anything, make sure they send something out to the group so we can Please. respond for or against draft comes out. Uh, they're also trying to get a committee together, maybe sponsor or coordinate some tours or outings for to get you know watershed councils together around the state to look at some projects maybe i think hopefully this summer they get something organized around that um, no one really volunteered to head up that committee yet but i think they're, they're trying to figure out how to get get around the state and see what other councils are doing other than just our reports you know at that right quarterly meeting down there um, a lot can happen in between those meetings so like us, they're still, I mean, even though they've been going a little longer than us, there's still not a lot happening there. They're trying to get all the other councils formed and approved. and That's and kind there. of the stage they're at, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So any, any questions on the state council? Okay. Uh, and then I passed around. So uh, a little over a year ago, uh, the Cash Water District kind of spearheaded this, but we had a number of uh, participating members, uh, you know, Bear River, Canal Company slash water users, Bear River Water Conservancy District, uh, multiple counties, soil conservation districts to fund this, this study. So it, it really probably started three plus years ago, uh, you know, really before the bad two years of drought. Uh, but as discussions were happening around the Great Salt Lake, they have a really good report that they had done in 2012 that showed the, the economic benefit of the lake. Uh, and legislators and decision makers really liked that summary of showing that benefit, and it, it was touted a lot. Um, but the economic benefit of all the watersheds that feed into the Great Salt Lake were never discussed. And so at that time, Cash Water District, you know, thought we need to figure out how to do a similar study on the Bear River watershed. What what does that river produce? Uh, 
and contribute to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not separate. It's it's tied together. But to know what what we use that water for and what that produces. So we got a number of collaborators together, uh, came up with the money. We just just had this study completed. Uh, so I passed out the executive summary, and Holly either has or will email out the link to the full document. It's fifty something pages, so I certainly want you know print that out. <laughs> Carl did. Okay. Carl did a nice print out of like there. This. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so you can read through that. Um, but you know we can go through this and just just some of the highlights. Uh, and it it includes all three states: so Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah. Uh, and in the full document, it, it breaks it out between the states, you know, how many irrigated acres are in each state, uh, the the production of ag in between each state, uh, which, you know, not surprisingly, agriculture is the big the big money one in there. Uh, if you look at that first page there, uh, the second side, the Bear River Irrigation, uh, 510 million in, in annual revenue from crops. And... And that's not total crop. So the value they assess is is the percentage of product exported outside of those ten counties. Because if you grow the crop and feed it to your own cows, it doesn't it doesn't generate new dollars for the for the economy. And so it's kind of, but that's how all the economic studies are done. They they tried to explain it to me, and I'm not an economist. Trevor probably could understand it much better. Um, so so this this is looking at. You, you don't know, have milk on there. <laughs> milk is so oh. milk is in there. It's it's in it's in the three hundred and fifty million app of of annual revenue of of animal products, whether that's mm. beef, lamb, milk are the top three, right? In there, and, and again, in the full document, it, it breaks that out. I think you know lamb's like twenty one million, which there's a lot there's a lot of lamb in the watershed that you don't see. So that total of eight hundred and uh, you know sixty million dollars. That's an annual export product, and we, and we we spell that out in there. That's exported outside the ten counties, not exported outside the country. And the majority of those exports stay within the Intermountain West. Um, you know, they're not. Some leave the country in the meat, milk products. You know, Gosner ship stuff all over. But and and of course, this doesn't break out where they all go. It just talks about exported out the ten, outside that ten county area, and so that people realize, you know. Uh, we're not sending all our hay to China Be because we do export a lot of alfalfa out of, out of the watershed. It's, it's the number one commodity that we produce is alfalfa. Um, but, but that's a pretty big, you know, annual impact, $850 million. And that changes year to year. So as, as you look through the full document, some of you that are more familiar with some of the numbers will, will probably question how we came up with one, the percentages of what's exported, and to the dollar amount of those crops, um, which, as you know, in ag, that fluctuates real quick. And so I think I think alfalfa in there was two hundred and twelve dollars a ton that we used for this price, which uh, you know was a little higher than what a lot of guys got last year, but a lot lower than what they were getting two years ago. And so, and, and milk's the same, right? Right now it's fourteen dollars. You know, it goes up and down so quick that that I mean, you can change this number by a couple hundred million dollars real quick. Um, but but we want to just you know a high a high level snapshot of what it was you know we didn't have half a million dollars to do this study and so it's not as in depth as as it could have been for that reason uh, and then we get down on that first page and thirty nine percent of that Great Salt Lake study is attributed to the Bear River uh, and again that changes year to year. Uh, in 2017, the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council had a study done, and that year, the Great the, the Bear River was only 33 percent of the inflow total, total inflow to the Great Salt Lake. In 2022, the Great Salt Lake Task Force Strike Team, their new number is 39 percent. Uh, if we put 23 numbers in there, it will change again. Um, but it shows that the Bear River is is critical to the Great Salt Lake at the same time as it is, is our watershed. Um, so for this, you know, that ends up being 372 million um, and another 18 million from the brine shrimp, from the, the mining industries in the brine shrimp is attributed to water coming in from, from the Bear River system. Uh, and, and why we thought that was critical is two reasons. One, because Great Salt Lake Advisory Council 
help fund this study because they wanted to see that tie and, and for us to show that. But this will show the, the decision makers and legislators that, that policies they want to implement upstream of the lake, whether it's on, on our river or the Weber or Ogden or Jordan, you know, we're going to give up a big economic impact up there for maybe the same or, or different impact on the lake, but it gives us a little bit of a of a value to put to that, right? We're supplying basically a third of the inflow to the Great Salt Lake out of the Bear River. Um, the other rivers are smaller and then you have direct precipitation is essentially about the same as what the bear puts in again, changes year to year, but those are the, you know, the big inputs. Uh, and so, and, and maybe not a surprise, but as they, as they target the ag optimization funding, you look at where a huge chunk of that funding has gone the last couple of years and it's cash and box out of the counties. Um, they recognize there, there's more to be gained for doing projects in our watershed than maybe the Weber or the Ogden because there's less, less agriculture, right? The, the, the quantity of water isn't there like it is up here. And so we think this will help us tie that together to show, you know, one, we probably need more funding in these counties up here to do those projects. Uh, and then also more studies and science to figure out how to get that potential saved water to the lake um, as we work together. There was a, a request this morning in the Natural Resources and Ag Appropriation Committee for for half a million dollars uh, to figure out how to do the split season leasing um, to get water to the lake. So that water, that money is going to go essentially to, to USU uh, you know, through the Great Salt Lake Commissioner um, to, to try to figure that out and then hopefully get a pilot project in place, which 500,000 isn't going to get much water leased uh, to get to the lake. So they, if, if they're going to do more than just a study to figure out the, the how-to of it, uh, they're going to probably need to put another zero or two behind that 500,000 um, to get the leasing going. But again, this this shows, you know, because that, that $850 million is being produced on 630-something thousand irrigated acres in the watershed. There's about 850,000 acres of ag just over 600,000 of that is irrigated. Um, and so as we, as they, as they look at that water and, and this study, um, again, it, it's hard to get accurate numbers from all three states, but that on an annual basis, that's somewhere between 1.3 and 2.6 million acre feet of diverted water um, to irrigate those 600,000 acres. Uh, and that varies year to year based on, you know, the climate, the rain, all those things. Um, but the depletion of that is only 60 something percent. And so if you take the low end, 1.3, uh, you know, 60 something percent of that, you're, you're only a little over 700,000 acre feet of depleted water. And if you look at the strike team's long term plan, they need an additional 400,000 acre feet a year for 30 years to, to make sure we maintain the lake at that, which, which on a, a lean year in the bear system would be half of the total water used between the three states of, of depleted water. Um, on, on a wetter year when we're using more, you know, then, then it's only a quarter of it. But that puts in per perspective, it's a pretty big hit to our economies to send that much water downstream. Yeah. And so they're, they're going to have to look at, you know, tens of millions of dollars into that leasing pool to get that quantity of water to the lake on a, an, a consistent annual basis. <laughs> and really, what I think... You know, there were some numbers out there, but I think this study gives us the first good comprehensive look at, at all three states, because not only are they going to need significant funding, but we're going to have to figure out how to get Idaho on board with, with the long-term leasing program, too, because there's not enough water between Cash and Box Elder uh, of depleted water to, to make up that difference and still have. I mean, I, I don't know what you could give up out of Bear River Canal Company for your depletion of your, you know, 230,000 acre feet you deliver. Um, even if it's diverted water, right? That you're half you're half of what they need on a yearly basis. That's that's a lot of, of dry land or semi-fallow ag acres that we have to look at if we don't include those other states in the equation. Um, and then if we go, the next page kind of breaks that out, the, the totals in there. Uh, but but on the last page, there's also a little over eleven thousand jobs associated. With the with the river, uh, and that mainly that is 
is again agriculture and then recreation. Recreation in the watershed is about $150 million. Uh, a good chunk of that comes from Bear Lake, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also, you know, did studies on all the other reservoirs, uh, the hunting clubs, the, the two bird refuges that are in that watershed, uh, took, took a percentage of all those. Uh, but the 11,000 jobs is another $400 million in, in salaries that's, that's brought into the watershed, uh, which, which in the end gets us. Uh, you know, just barely under $2 billion in annual revenue to those, those 10 counties, which uh, I, I think is pretty significant. Um, and that, that doesn't include any multiplier effect, right? That doesn't account what agriculture does for the Bear River co-op jobs, the IFAs, the, all those, those next level jobs that also rely on that economy. That's just really direct sales from the farms and direct benefits, uh, from from the recreation that happens in the watershed, so I think we're we're trying to get a, a concise summary of this ready by the end of the week to send uh, to all the legislators. So as they pass some of these bills that uh, may have impacts on on our watersheds, that one they they have that in there, and then two, it's going to request them, you know, to make sure uh, that they visit with with us as a watershed and and a, and a council, you know, however they interact. So that we're involved with those decisions, which if you look around the table, a number of us, we see each other down at the legislature, you know, you know, we are involved and we do have some pretty good local representatives that, that keep us involved with most things, but there's always one or two deals that you may not hear about that, um, you know, we, we would hope they continue to, to stay in the as close as they have been in the past. Um, but really, there may be more questions when you have time to read the, the 50 page report. Uh, is there a link to that? Uh, Holly, yeah, should send it out. Oh, yeah. okay. so you can email that out. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a new link actually this, this morning, too. So send that out. There's one typo that Carl's going to have off in his big printout. He goes, Luckily, it was nothing major, but <laughs> you, you just, always find them once it's printed. It's yeah. going to crucify you, right? Now. Yeah, you can just you can just mark over, put a little white out on there. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, at least, at least from what we've seen, we were pretty pleased with with the numbers that, that came back from that. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of production that happens in the watershed, and and you know, no surprise to anyone that the majority of that is agriculture. You know, well over when you're figuring the jobs, well over a billion dollars a year um, from that base agriculture production. Uh, and if you counted total production, you know, not not what's used on farm, then those numbers would would be higher in some of those counties. So. I've got some questions for you. Bring it. Um, is there a dollar amount then for the hunting clubs? I would be really surprised if they would share that information, but I'd sure like to know. So there isn't from the direct ones, right? They they, they don't, yeah, you can't call the million dollar duck club and say, you know, what was your annual revenue from your dues and all your stuff this year? Well, you can, you can say that. Yeah. So, so they take, okay. they take other studies that have Probably. been done, other studies in the Intermountain West that have been done. So you can, at the end of that, it'll show all the sources. And I think their hunting survey result is actually out of Montana because yeah, they didn't have a great one from the great Salt Lake duck clubs. That may be higher because some of those, Membership fees and annual fees are not low, uh, but again, we yeah we we didn't have access to all those numbers. Okay, no, uh, we did get uh, Pacific Corps did provide their actual generation numbers. You see, and there's just under twenty million dollars in in power generation off the river through their different hydro facilities. Uh, and then the the other one, most uh, unlike the Wasatch Front, most of our cities don't use river water for culinary systems, right? We all rely on wells, springs for the most part. There's a couple small systems that, that do have surface water, but we don't treat like Weaver Basin and, and the, for the most part in, in the watershed. And so the groundwater sources that could or could not end up in the Bear River weren't, weren't counted because that, again, is a, another level of depth that we would have to spend a little more money to get that. But again, we know that that uh, is is a big source. And it, you know, it talks about what the cities would use for their annual water, but it doesn't necessarily say we're we're accounting that cost to the Bear River itself. 
So what other states spent money on this study? None. None? Idaho yeah. didn't spend any? I thought they were... They were. They applied for a number of grants that none came through. Okay. So we spent a little extra on it. Hmm. The, the two the two county council the two counties cash and box elder county both put money into it the two water districts put money into it uh three soil conservation districts put money into it bear river canal company slash bear river water users uh, great salt lake advisory council that might be everybody that helped fund it so how cooperative were idaho and wyoming on providing information for this? Uh, they were pretty cooperative. And early on, they were really cooperative and, and excited for the study. But then we lost Laura Gale, who was helping coordinate a lot of that through BRAG. And uh -huh. I call it iBRAG. It's I brag. something different than that, but I call it iBRAG. <laughs> They're equivalent of BRAG. I brag, you brag. Uh, <laughs> and they had someone switch over up there. And then that, that connection kind of fell apart. And I think that's why the grants up there didn't come through. If it wouldn't have taken so much time to run around, I think I could have got the, the soil conservation districts on the Idaho side to all put some money in too. But it got down to the point of, you know, with another week or two of my time running across Idaho, easier or do I just tell cash water district you're paying an extra $10,000. You know, that's what it came down to. It's really just time yeah. of trying to chase money down in the shortened window that we had. The one, make sure we had enough funding in place to get the study started and have it done um, by this time. And so it was, you know, if we would have had another year to find funding, we would have gone for, for a higher amount and done even more in depth and got more partners on board. Uh, but I, I mean, we'll I'm still gonna take this through Idaho and uh, present it to those counties up there and those soil conservation districts that, that we're interested to start with. Um, maybe the Idaho Farm Bureau would be interested also. But, because they're looking at doing enhanced stuff, you know, in the, in the Bear River watershed with with uh, cloud seeding in, as a state, um, and if we can get local people there interested in it to, to what that does for them, then we can hopefully get more support for that. So yeah, no funding from those states, and Wyoming really wasn't involved at all. We knew it was a small enough chunk and um, too hard to coordinate that. So, yeah, I mean it was they're, they're at the start there, but their the numbers are counted in here, um, but. They weren't involved at all. It is interesting. Evanston is the only surface water out of the Bay River. Say, they start up top where it's still clean, of. right? It's yeah. still pretty clean and yeah, easy to use. You don't, clean, there's not a lot of treatment that has to happen. Um, yeah, it, there's not there's not a lot to do it. I think that them and uh, Brigham City <laughs> takes a little out of the springs at Manaway, right? It, it could be counted as surface water. Uh, and Logan City with the wet springs. That's what when we got looking at that deep, trying to tease those numbers out, it, it was a little more in depth than, than we had time to look at for culinary water use. Because there is some surface water coming out of springs that cities use without really much, if any, treatment. But um, still, those connections got a little hard. The mineral extraction dollars is interesting to me. So pretty high. So we took that from that 12, 2020, uh, 2012 study, right? Uh, and we just took 39% of that number. That's that's how we got to it. So the number that's listed, the 372 million? Is 39% of their total mineral production from their study. Oh. And that was based on, in 2022, the Bear River accounted for 39% of the inflow into the lake. One thing to think about with that, Christy, is that we don't get any minerals from natural precipitation. Yeah, they're all so coming. The number is they, actually a lot higher. Yeah, and again, another another one, right? That's hard to tease out. Does the bear right. put more minerals in than the weaver? I mean, it does quantity wise for flow, but yeah, that was it. it all comes from runoff from the lands and hmm. whatever the water runs through to get it there. So it probably is higher. But this is the only number you can say. Yes, you know, right. It's, and again, it changes so, you know, like I say, three years before that, it was 6% lower, which 6% of a billion dollars, you know, it adds up when you, we're talking percentages. And so I think I think it's not to focus on those numbers as much, which that was one. We had a couple board members that, you know, they almost wanted to throw the study out when they saw that 33%, because they've seen the report that showed a bear at 60%, right? 
of, of time. And if you look at only the river inflow, then it jumps up to that. But you have to account for direct precipitation on the lake, which is almost equivalent to what the bear puts in there. Because uh, so, it's massive. Yeah, it, it's huge. And so if you don't, if you look at it the other way, uh, <laughs> then they want the bear to make up a bigger chunk of, you know, but if we're only 33% of the inflow, Maybe they should look for us to make up 33% of that 400,000 acre feet, not 90% of that 400,000 acre feet. This is, this is awesome. Yeah. Like, and then the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council, they, I mean, they reviewed it a couple of times. They were, they, they didn't question those numbers. They just, I mean, they, the one came right from their study that they had, they had done. So it was, it was good. So they, they agreed that. They we, did the we've 2012 got to work study? Yeah. Okay. I have one. Mm -hmm observation that may or may not apply okay <laughs> but but i know you talk about bear lake and the recreation mm -hmm. and the impact of bear lake um was there any thought of the construction money that pours into bear lake every year and and the property taxes and the <laughs> yeah so i, I mean the right. construction activity that's taking place up there is phenomenal and yeah the money the contractors and the people and the yeah, it didn't. It didn't go to that. that would be the right. That would be the next level of a bigger study. What 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 does that recreation now bring to the economy for the next level? This is just direct yeah, recreation okay. dollars spent. Yeah, short -term not, rental, short -term yeah, not rental. what it's doing to the the tax base for the county. Yeah, most of those are second homes, so they're paying one hundred percent tax. Yeah, I don't know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, to to the county, it, it brings on a whole other level of economic economic value. benefit that's not there. Um, but it also brings a whole other level of economic headache of you know you have more road maintenance more yeah. uh, all those others and so that one it yeah it doesn't go that deep okay because that's well in my opinion it's a pretty big impact yeah the, yeah for, for those guys and i don't think they looked at that because well, two years yeah. prior to this they <laughs> did an economic study just on bear lake uh -huh. so the state and brag did that okay um, and I don't think even that one went to that level. Okay. It looked at more what's the direct impact of recreation uh, and, the, and the impact of Bear Lake in yeah. the area. And that just then looked at those two counties. The short term rentals are out of control, actually, yeah. in my opinion, up there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people making a lot of money in the short term rentals up yeah. there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Jay, did you have a question? No, you answered it. Okay. <laughs> I just appreciate the Cash Water District taking the tip of the spear on this and moving it forward because this is an excellent political tool for us to show that that there are a lot of things to consider. And I feel like for those around the table whose groups invested funds into seeing it done, um, it's going to be money well spent for probably more than a decade. So thank yeah. you for yeah. taking the effort and and doing that because all of us around this table are going to benefit from your efforts. Yeah, and, that, and that was the main, like like you said, that the main reason we wanted to do it was so that we had that tool to work politically um, with all the stakeholders in, in the Great Salt Lake watershed as we look for solutions not only to protect what you know we produce and, and grow in our communities, but also then do our part to help with with the Great Salt Lake. That's very very good. good. Very yep. good. Thank you. Yeah. It'll give you something to read tonight. It sends that link out. Especially, yeah, that 50 page one. Yeah, give you a little more to read than the two page, <laughs> two page summary. We appreciate the summary. Trevor, are you ready to go? I am. Could you go ahead and let me share? Yes. We're on agenda item three slash four. Yeah. If you're following four. along. And this is the big bulk of today's business. So. Okay. So for those of you who are not as familiar, but would like to become more familiar with where bills are at and how they work. And if you have one that you want to track, you can come to, this is just uh, le.utah.gov. This is the legislature's website. 
and you can click on this little settings here next to this wheel and you can create an account and it's pretty simple and straightforward just a username and password associated with an email but then you can come in and you can go through the different bills and so what i typically do is i'll pick the subjects here and i i search ag and water and you know a couple other things but if you click in a subject such as water and then you click find it'll show you everything that has to do with water that's on um, the state's website. So if they're talking about some bill and you don't know what the bill number is, you can find it through here. And so here's all the water bills and these are the ones that I'm tracking, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and go over to the bills that I'm tracking so we can go through that. Okay, so these first five here, six here, our bills that are a bill file has been opened, but no bill has been um, it's not been numbered. It hasn't made it to rules or done anything like that. So these might happen. They might not. We're getting deep enough into the session that if something's not numbered, unless it's a priority by leadership, it's probably not going to see the light of day. Most things have been numbered at this point. Um, but I'm just going to go down through these water bills. Um, they're, most of them are fairly large bills, so the, all of the numbers smaller, there are some big changes that are happening. So starting with the uh, water uh, efficiency landscape requirements there with Doug Owens. Will you, list, will you note the bill number, please? Uh, this is HB 11. Um, this one has to do with, and let me make sure, because he's got two bills here. Well, one's, I think, the substitute. He listed it twice, which I don't know why. <clears throat> I saw that today when I was looking at mine. Let's see, I just need to make sure that I'm looking sure at the right why. one here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Saves the same number and half so seconds. when you click on it, and I'm sorry, but Zoom is like taking over my computer here, so I can't get to the tabs. Give me just a sec here then. Okay, we're gonna go back to this. Okay, so this first one, HB eleven, is um Essentially, governmental entities cannot have more than 20%, new builds cannot have more than 20% in non-functional turf. That's the basis of the bill. The idea is that government ought to be being the example if we're expecting private citizenry to use less turf in the way they build. 20% of what? Their footprint of uh, what they're building on. Does that include schools? Are schools counted in? Mm -hmm. But they have a lot of functional yeah. turf. Yeah, schools yeah. can count functional turf a lot easier than. So, water right publications by Joel Briscoe. Joel Briscoe, or this is essentially they're making it so that the state engineer can look up proof of publication electronically, which will speed up the speed at which they can process change applications and new applications by quite a bit. They'll still be published in the local papers, but it's just that confirmation that the pub paper actually put it in their newspaper. Before they were having to cut out sections of the newspaper and mail it to the state engineer's office and they had to file a paper yes. copy and it, it was just a lot of work for these guys. So that should fix that. Um, the next one is measuring and water accounting amendments. This is HB, so last one was HB 42. The next one's HB 61, Carl Albrecht, water measurement and accounting amendments. This essentially just adds telemetry and measurement infrastructure to um, the suite of things that the, the state can provide monies for oh. um, with their, with their what's the right word, Skyler? Essentially, in the state engineer's budget, they can use some of that to help um, monitor river systems, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think they're trying to save, yeah, carry over some of the money and expand it. So this is came up. Right. The next one is HB6. There's a substitute on this. This is a Doug Owens bill, um, uh, Utah Waterways Amendment. So the Utah Waters Way, Waterways, its big thing is it's the private governmental partnership that allows money from, say, like the Miller Foundation or from uh, Adobe or whoever to flow into state coffers to help with the issues surrounding water, the Great Salt Lake. This is really limited, though, part of their um, to uh, educate the public. And so this is essentially reintroducing the education as far as how the water cycle works. 
into the Utah curriculum. So they're going to help develop that and give it to the State Board of Education and work with them on that. Um, the reason there's a substitute is because they were worried that there was going to be a Great Salt Lake slant one way or the other on it. So they're okay. trying to take a very neutral walking down the edge of the sword. <laughs> so anyways, we'll see where that one goes. Um, next one is the Columbia Interstate Compact, HB 205, 206. Um, Representative Peterson from the uh, box and cash area. Um, essentially, there is there was... We're part of the Columbia River Compact, but the compact actually was never ratified by most of the states. And so it's just removing an, a piece of code that's not actually used. The next one is water usage data amendments. Um, this is just a, a change on reporting as far as how water information comes in from the state. Is that, I don't know which one. you had anything else on that it's Ballard's bill? No. No, that's uh, isn't that the one where she wants the reporting from the schools? Is that that one? I look. think so. Oh, that's you're right. That's Ballard's only bill. She she wants all schools to report water use, and then the state water resources have got to then go look at a map of that school to assess how much they've used per acre, and then see if they're using too much. This is all schools, right? All or, schools. Yeah, yeah, it's very. That's right. Yeah, that's that was hers. I swear all these bills are going to quadruple the size of the division of water resources. Yeah, and so far nothing none, none of them have asked for extra personnel. Yeah, we'll we'll see see that <laughs> Director Austin Yeager got another job. Um the next one is 243, HB 243. This is riparian amendments by um, Representative Benyon. She was essentially looking at trying to make it so that cities had the ability to add riparian areas or wetland areas into their city plans. It's gotten a lot of resistance and so she emailed me this morning and said there's going to be a substitute bill coming out soon the original bill essentially made it so that they had um regulatory abilities that um that could not would but could um make it difficult for um projects like uh pipelines or roads or things like that. I mean, the, the purpose was to kind of help use riparian areas to help mitigate flooding. So the purpose of the bill, in my opinion, was good. Um, but it, it uh, kind of gets got down into some things where they were almost another Army Corps of Engineers, which that that's a lot of doing to give to a local entity. So we'll see what the the um, the substitute comes out as because it's supposed to be paired back pretty hard. Um, water related changes, HB 280. This is the big bill. This is the one for the session. This is our favorite. So this is essentially taking, we're going to try to fund water differently in the state on a macro level. They've estimated before 2060 that there's about 30, uh, 38 billion, or 28 or 38, 38. 38. 38 billion dollars worth of water, either new installations or replacement of existing infrastructure that must occur. And that's essentially a billion dollars a year. And so we've invested a lot of money in water over the last couple of years, but it's kind of like, well, we've got to stay on this pace if we even want to hold where we are. And so um, it kind of restructures how we would approach this and it follows the way that UDOT runs their model. And how UDOT runs their model is essentially all the areas bring in all their projects and a central committee goes ahead and ranks those projects in order of importance. Things they consider are, you know, people who, how many people use that road, the chance of failure, can this hold on a little longer versus another project, and then they rank them through, and then they just go till they run out of money. It's a really good model, but the problem is, is that UDOT owns all the infrastructure, whereas water systems yeah. um, are owned by thousands of entities throughout the state, right? Cities, irrigation companies, so on and so forth, right? And so it's really hard to know, well, how do you compare a, a project for Bear River Canal Company against a project for uh, the Cash Water District, right? Or for it's Newton fun. Irrigation Company, because we've got different needs and different problems, right? The other thing is, um, I know you don't want to appreciate me saying this, but a road's a road, right? <laughs> but in water, we have drinking water, sewer, or drainage. Um, culinary, secondary, and agriculture, and I'm probably forgetting something too, but um, 
how do you compare a stormwater project to an agricultural project? And so they've con the substitute contemplates giving the, the state the ability to make rules. And in those rules, they would kind of parse it out so that you're comparing apples to apples and the state could focus on specific areas based on the percentages of the fund they would apply to those areas. But the problem is, is the bill is so um, high level that everyone's a little bit nervous about, well, this is how it's going to work in theory, but how will it work in practice? And so they're a little worried about the administration of it. The second part, and probably the thing that is going to be the bill's biggest hurdle, is that it does involve a fee. So the original bill said that it was based on culinary connections because we all drink water, right? So everyone pays their part. Now it's based on um, water supply. Right? Water, any any entity that supplies that sells water to the end user at a price is required to pay a fee, and it leaves it at that. So how big the fee is, how it would be administered, how it would work, nobody knows. And so it's created a lot of fear. And um, I, I really, I'm glad that Representative Snyder is bringing this up as an, as an item that we need to address because we do have some water problems in the state as far as we've got to put more money in there with the feds stepping away from funding water projects just to stay even. But uh, there, I mean, all of you sat up a little straighter when I told you you're now going to get a fee per acre foot. Well, we don't even know if it's going to be per acre foot or per using agency either. There's just, they said, we're going to pass this and then we're going to figure out how we're going to do the fee. And that makes people really uncomfortable. Water, <laughs> water resources are going to have two years to come up with that fee structure. Well, and one thing that makes me nervous is that it, I don't know if it still does, but it, there's a lot of different funding mechanisms that different water providers can use right now, but it was channeling all of those into to the umbrella of this one body. And, and that's not good to not have those options. It still kind of does. They all still have their separate programs, but but they would still, all the projects, big projects, you know, this isn't going to be, you know, you're putting a new head gate on your canal, it's not going to come through this. But they would still flow through this new screening criteria somehow because if it's all federal funding right they got other strings attached that may contradict and so he is trying to figure out how you still keep them separate but bring them together which isn't well it's fine easy. to add to add another option but the code amends all those other all those other pieces of 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 code, it, it amends like fifty pieces of code, so that scares that's, that's me right there. Pages long, you know. <laughs> it also takes in the most. The substitute also talks about lending, so it's unclear whether that affects water resource lending, um, and that, that they will have to follow the priorities or not, because um, his intention is to leave existing funding sources alone and add this on as another piece of funding. But um, my concern is, uh, well, a concern I've thought about is that um, it could also make it so the state is not as apt to fund, say, like the Ag Optimization or the 319 Fund or whatever other successful projects we've got because they have one place where they know it's being ranked in a way that um, has some kind of priority system. And so anyway, there's chances these other programs could become victim to that, something to think about. So it's highly controversial. It was taken to committee yesterday and tabled, which means that's code word for we need to sit down and rework the bill. Um, Mr. Snyder is a is a um, ambitious individual. He's going to pass a bill. We need to understand that. Um, and so it just kind of depends on what, what that finished product looks like, um, you know, Hopefully it's something that gives us time to figure out the fee before we're all locked into it. But again, it's his prerogative and he is the, is it assistant whip or the? He's the majority. Yeah. The majority whip. And that's an influential position. Leadership is behind the bill as well. So um, given the fee though, I just want to make you guys aware that we'll all have some skin in the game on this one. So. Oh, Todd Stoneley has a question for you online. 
Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, before you move on to the next bill, Trevor, and thanks for your great summary of that bill. There is an aspect of this bill that um, modifies the state water plan statutes. And it actually, at our request, lists uh, agencies that shall work with us to cooperate on the state water plan. And the local watershed councils is among those entities that we would like to work with as we formulate the state water plan. So, so, so hopefully that's something that you would be supportive of and look forward to working with us on. And we think you'd have a lot of good things to offer us as we move forward with state water planning. Thanks for adding that, Todd. I would agree. That's a really good thing because although it's trying to centralize it, it's also trying to get us a state water plan. A lot of this is driven out of the audit, the water audit that was done this last year. They're trying to correct some of the deficiencies that were noted in there. And so um, it has some really good things in it too, um, not just concerns. So uh, <laughs> uh, I hope we I hope we can get it worked out because it would be good if we can get the details worked yeah. out. The next version is already underway, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Milestone. Um, the next yeah. one is House Bill 295, reduced water amendments. This has to do with the oil field. For every uh, five barrels of oil you bring up, you bring three barrels of really intense salt water up. So this gives them the authority to use that water and market it amongst themselves to do for drill water or um, fracking water. It makes so they don't have to use the fresh water out in the basin because they can. They have the authorization to use this instead of just, right now they're evaporating it or shoving it back in the ground through injection wells. So it lets them use it several times and then the whatever is left does have to be injected back down into the ground or evaporated. So. It's something that was kind of already done in practice, but it formalizes um, state engineers' authority in that. At, on like, it's essentially it makes it so that the uh, oil mining and gas takes care of it, unless it influences some sort of fresh water. And it's a good bill. It's a good thing. Next one is water usage amendments by Doug Owens. This is House Bill Four Hundred One. Sure. This one is uh, about. Uh, Essentially, you can be penalized if you irrigate your lawn before the 1st of yeah, April, April or May. The 1st of April or the end of October. Right. And you get penalized from your neighbor turning you in. Uh, <laughs> get a reward. Sorry, I, what you You get a reward for turning them in. Oh. It's just crazy. I, I didn't get that. There is. I thought that was a penalty, but you get a reward. Nope, you get a reward, and they get a penalty. I mean, oh, I, I don't think it's going to. I don't, this bill. I don't think it will pass. But it, and then it, and then it requires the Department of Water Resources. You don't have to be the enforcer. <laughs> it requires water resources to give an annual report of how much water was saved because of this bill. Oh God. Which is going to be almost zero. There's going to be signs in the yard. We don't we don't water before April <laughs> or after October 31st. Farmer on farmer violence. No, how, how are you going to calculate how much water gets saved in Cash County because of this bill? You just make right? it up. You just make it up. But I mean, like our <laughs> landlords, our landlords, I think I could get them on that because they always have pipes broken and things accidentally going. So I think no, but I if you have a broken them. pipe, it won't count. You got to be have your sprinklers running. It's because I think cycled this bill from last session yeah. and has tooled it a little bit different. I mean, I'm guessing it. Doug does. Owens is a guy who thinks outside of the box. I appreciate <laughs> the way he looks at the world. Um, but every once in a while, uh, I told him this is just he, this is what this is way. one way he's looked at it that's unique. So, anyway, <laughs> nice way. Uh, shareholder <laughs> water amendments by Sandal. This is a uh, Senate Bill 39, SB 39. Um, this is just changing back the shareholder change application to the way it was 12 months ago. Um, there were some issues on if canal companies could react fast enough, and he decided that, that the former code balanced the interest very well. So he decided to switch that back. It was part of a bigger bill last year. Um, the last one is the water rights restricted account amendments by Sandal, Senate Bill 77. I've got to look at this one again. It allows, this is a partner bill to what we discussed earlier in get freeing up some funds and allowing certain state funds to help with the funding of USGS gauges um, and other measurement practices. So um, these are all the ones I'm tracking. Um, the last, well, the last one that will probably come about is what we talked about a little bit earlier with 
the Great Salt Lake uh, Watershed Council. It is anticipated that it may come from the speaker's office. And so it'll have a lot of horsepower behind it. Um, but as we discussed earlier, there's good reasons why we wouldn't necessarily support it because the whole idea behind watershed councils is it's grassroots up. And this would be very much top down because these individuals were originally appointed by the governor um, and their renewals have been appointed by the governor, nothing really local. And so as a member of the council, I would submit that when the bill does come out, if it doesn't have representation from our watershed or deal with that in some way, shape or form that we um, draft a letter mm -hmm. uh, indicating we do not support the bill. Um, because part of the reason why at least the, so I knew some of you before we formed the council and when we were talking about watershed councils, the idea was is that that allows us to have some influence in the Great Salt Lake discussion. That was a lot of the reason why we wanted to make sure we were involved in this group is because it helped us make sure that our concerns were pushed up the ladder and we were heard, particularly in the Great Salt Lake discussions. Otherwise, I don't know that it would have got the support that it needed to pass. And I just kind of feel like that uh, if we don't have the representation, why would we support the group? To support the change, I should say. But what is their thoughts on that? That's a good plan. I, I agree. We need to respond if, if we're against it. And if they have it the other way, then we could send a letter in support of it. Mm -hmm. If they do have it, like we talked earlier, that it, it still includes someone from each of those councils so, that touches the lake. A question I have is if they take the approach of just adding the com a commissioner from the remaining counties, are we okay with that as a as a compromise? Or do you feel like it needs to come, that representation needs to come from the councils themselves? I think the councils make a lot more sense in that not to put county council members or county commissioners down, but oftentimes they're not involved with discussions like this as much that to have the insight for water that, that you would get from someone from this council. I mean, like right now, you're you're selected from ours to represent on this, the Great Salt Lake one if, if and when it gets up and running in a form that allows us to appoint someone. You probably know more about water in the watershed than anyone on the Box Elder County Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, the, or the County yeah, County, yeah, County yeah. or Ridge County. That's one of the big things and that, that I really I liked think it would stay with this. About the Watersheds Council Act was that each watershed in the Great Salt Lake Basin had a member at that Great Salt Lake Watershed Council. Because otherwise, I think um, I'm really aware of what our watershed council can do on its own. And, and we have multiple entities on our council that have their own lobbyists at the state. And so I don't want to dilute our the ear we have for legis legislative things and especially for the Great Salt Lake. So, yeah. Don't we have a Great Salt Lake representative on here now? There's not a Great Salt Lake Council yet. I mean, we preemptively elected Trevor to be the representative the way the Watersheds Council Act is set up. I thought we had somebody to give us a presentation last. Laura Vernon is the Great Salt Lake Basin. Laura, help me out. I don't know. I was just wondering if she would. Yeah, coordinator. Understand that more why they would want to go that route instead of have the full input. But the other route, well, like does that? It's already that councils already exist and they're up and running. You don't ruffle feathers by adding is a seven or six more individuals from those other councils that they only would maybe change what they've been working on for quite some time. And they do have some significant political influence, um, and that's good and bad, um, depending on, you know, where you sit with the issues. Um, and so it's, but yeah, it's an existing council that has functioned for 15, 20 years now. And they've, they've been able to get the legislature to send money their way to do, to fund studies and projects and I, I can chime in on that a little bit if you guys are 
I'm curious. So the, the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council has been around since 2010, um, and they originally had no um, funding. Um, they were just a recommending body to the legislature, to the governor. Um, but as of a couple of years ago, they now receive um, revenue from brine shrimp royalties, the, from brine shrimp harvested on the lake. Uh, and that's about $125,000 annually that goes into the advisory council um, pot, which is uh, distributed through forestry, fire, and state lands. So, and you guys have hit it right on the head. They, um, you know, they're very lake centric and they don't have uh, representatives necessarily in the watershed except for the county uh, representatives that they have. So. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely one to watch. Um, creating letters from the Bear River Watershed Council is somewhat problematic um, in that uh, a body, we, as a body, we have to, um, I felt really uncomfortable sending the letter to Laura Vernon and having it be from the Watershed Council because we hadn't discussed that as a council, but the comment period ended before this meeting. Um, but we might, depending on when our next meeting is, that might be another issue that comes up. And we, I guess we can always have a a virtual meeting or an email acclamation, or, or we could even help me. Where we're not necessarily a like a legal right, decision making entity, we, we could have... even vote at this meeting that if that bill comes up, one way or the other, we authorize you to, to write a letter and send it out for feedback. Um, that's a good idea, so that we could still get that done without calling another meeting. Because if, if it comes up, it'll probably be quick, right? We'll probably see it on a. Wednesday will be on the agenda on a Thursday and they'll, they'll go to the floor the next week. So we won't have necessarily a couple of weeks to try to get everyone back together. I think we can do it similar to the other one, but we have a little more, right? We have a little heads more, up. a little more heads up because we're, we're discussing it here and it seems we're pretty unanimous in our persuasion one way or the other, depending on what way that bill might come out. Mm -hmm. and so I, I would feel comfortable taking a vote that we are in support or against it, depending on which way it it comes out. At the very least, it would need to have, like you said, um, county representation from the counties. They're in the watershed for the um, Great Salt Lake, but maybe on, on a contingent border. Any the trouble motion? with going with the counties is uh, technically Beaver and Millard are also in the drainage, but they, it's just a small sliver as it goes along the Nevada border. And so, yeah, it's similar to, yeah. Um, I mean, that's why watersheds was a better way to do it, is because it included that's in the West Desert watershed. But we'll see where it goes. It could be so inflammatory that they'll just decide to leave it alone and deal with it maybe in the in interim. But uh, at some point, the does have to form. The law says that yeah. we've got to form a Great Salt Lake Watershed Council. So, Trevor, is there an approach? I mean, Christy brought up lobbying and other groups have a more coordinated effort. Do we as watersheds in the collective sense have that kind of representation? No, our, I mean, our, our, our way of doing this would be to send a letter, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly watershed councils was a bit of a, came up through Warren Peterson was kind of the one that that uh, formed up the idea and he and Peter Gessel pushed it along and, and now Warren works a lot with Farm Bureau. So I feel like Farm Bureau will likely take a position on it when it comes out if it's not, you know, if it's got that same slant of, of not including this grassroots movement versus the top down. Um, so there there are some group lobbying groups that are gonna kind of put some horsepower to it, but 
Um, the other thing is the water conservancy districts are not included in this either. And they're going to have some things to say about that because they wanted to be on the council for the HB 280, the one that decides what projects rank out and not. That's another controversial thing about the bill. Um, and the rest of us don't get to be on the council. So it's like, oh boy. So I don't think they're going to go away quietly either. Okay. Um, but I would be happy to volunteer to, to draft a letter once it comes out, if it's needed, um, and then give it to you to spruce up and distribute to the group um, with yeah. the caveat that if Todd has his hand up too. Yeah. Go, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, I'll just remind you that the, the local councils have a mechanism to bring things up to the state, the Utah Watersheds Council, the statewide council, and then that body can advise the governor and the legislature for the act. As it come, uh, uh, you know, as it relates to specific bills that you want to comment on, that process maybe isn't very helpful or timely. So I don't think there's anything wrong with you reaching out and, and um, giving your two cents about things, especially as it relates to Watershed Councils Act revisions. So I think that would be appropriate for you to chime in on that one in particular. Just my thought. I'm not saying you can or can't do anything. Just there's other avenues that you have officially have at your disposal to advise the governor and legislature through that state council. One thing we can do as a watersheds council too is just keep our members up to date on where things are at. And as always, you're you're always welcome to represent the organization that you're behind in a letter on any bill or you know anything that's well, on your individual legislature. Later, I mean, the individuals from cash in our group are going to be far more influential with Snyder than us from Box Elder mm -hmm. County or from Rich County, given that you're con his constituents. Mm -hmm. um, he will likely be the one who'll run the bill, is what the word on the ground is, but who knows who the leadership would assign it to. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but Peterson's really good. Uh, I mean, we really got some good legislators in our watershed when it comes to water issues. So maybe that's the better way to do it is, is that what your preference would be? That, that would get more letters too, as long as we can, I mean, that is my preference as far as like input from more people always looks better than just, I can put the watershed council name to something, but that, that document won't have all of your names on it, you know, and who you represent. But I think that's all an important document, though. If, if yeah. this body's going to have you any do, kind you do of it both ways, right? You way have one letter. structure. Yeah, I mean, that's true. You have one letter that comes from from the council, and then each organization. If we want influence, that's the way to do it. Absolutely. Letter. You got to start going to the table if you want to see. Yes. Do we yeah. do we have letterhead that has the name? <laughs> <of it? laughs> no. It wouldn't be too hard to create that. No. Thank you. We yeah. need a logo, though. We need a logo. And there are two other little water bills that, that, sent out the minutes and that are out there. A bear uh, drink uh, a <laughs> Senator Senator Hinkins has a secondary water meter bill. Yeah, I heard something about that it's too. It's a pretty minor change. It looks like it's going to fly right through. It's just so those that already could have qualified for an exemption. If you look at the news article, it looks like it's exempt everybody of a certain size. But you already had to be a mix of pressurized and open ditch and have ag. And before that, it was for those with a thousand connections and under. So it's just changing it to 2,500 connections and under. Oh. Uh, so pretty minor. And then I think just today, Representative Snyder might have had another bill that tweaks the secondary metering on, but I haven't seen that one yet. But I just heard a rumor that, but it was another minor tweak like that, that it was nothing that looked like it would change, it would change much. But there must be one canal company that affected somewhere. And so they got him to run those those two little changes. One other cool thing about the legislature tracker that I've shared is it can email you about the bills. So when it's going to be heard in committee, because as a normal citizen, other than calling your representative, it's a committee, not at the floor. And um, so it can email you about those and you can kind of find when things come up on agenda. Um, you don't have to go down in person. You can either listen in through YouTube, or if you want to comment, they have a Zoom function for which you can log into the meeting just like this meeting. And then when when you when your item comes up and they get to public comment, you raise your hand 
and then they actually will let you into the meeting. It's a little bit of a process that so just be aware that it's a little, uh, it takes a second for you to get into the meeting, but you can get in and you can make a comment. Generally, it's less than two minutes though. So make sure you have a 30 have second have version and a one. two minute version yeah, of what you you're going to say. Camera, they won't let you talk. No. Yep. Yeah. So be dressed. <laughs> they say the coming not personal experience. So just yeah. At least, at least we only make that away. mistake once. <laughs> you know, well, one of the least above the way. Yeah. Yeah. Challenging contribution. Yeah. One more. So Sean, Senator Hinkins' bill is SB one twenty five. Thank you. And Representative Snyder's is HB B two seventy five, and his is opening up more. So they had in there the. The exemption that if you qualified for that and you'd already been accepted funding, you could use it for something else. This expands that a little bit. Oh, that's good. So so already you, got can, a you can apply for that for substitution on it. Yeah. And I just tried to read it right Which now. Which one? Okay. Hankins or Snyder? Snyder's 275, but I can't tell it's sub? different. God, I wonder what yeah, I just saw the one email from. Let's see if I can. Yeah, there it is. Snyder 275. For sub. Yeah, those may impact like Mark heard your Hyde Park. Um, yeah, a lot of we had yeah. the irrigation that got the, the grant and then they could do some other stuff. But I think this is going to even allow that if you haven't gotten a grant yet, you could apply for one and still use it for some of those other things. Like headgate meters, maybe? Yeah. Or strategic or, well, or even potentially piping part of your open ditch. If you can show water savings. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, well, not that there's a lot of money. <laughs> how good it's going to be. 275 is water wise landscape. Oh, that's not it. It's 175. Right? 175. Okay. So, um, Mark has his hand up. Mark, go ahead. Uh, just since you threw it out there, uh, I was just going to comment and echo that. Yeah, I think the changes actually are very positive for situations like the majority of the canal systems through Logan on that. That bill you were just talking about there's a lot of potential there for modernizing the delivery to help uh, generate savings you know relative to other projects it's minor but it's one of those we all do a little we can all do a lot so i think it is a positive change all right thank you mark hey mark as a member of usac I, yes. I wondered how to how to suggest this because I realize you're one of my bosses during the day, but in the context of this conversation, um, with UAC meeting weekly, if county commissioners are really angling to get those extra seats that may be afforded versus the watershed, do you think the letter campaign is is um, about as helpful as it could be, or do you perceive that your peer group within UAC is not all that stirred up about this subject and they'd be willing to forego Trevor's thought that they'd they'd be on that broader council membership. Um, so given that in any of the uh, UAC meetings I've been a part of, uh, which isn't all, but has been several, um, this bill, these, this hasn't been brought up yet. So I think that matches the latter part of your comment, which is they might not be all that concerned about it. Um, that also could just be priorities as working through priorities from the beginning of the legislative session to now. That may, you know, there's always priorities will shift and change as, as revisions come along. Um, but this is the first meeting I've been in where it's been discussed. So I don't know that there's as much concern or, or push for it. I also um, don't, since we haven't talked about it, I, I I can't gauge the room with the limited experience I've had of only one year with the group, but I'm happy to kind of get a feel for it. Awesome. So would we need a motion to give you authority to write this letter saying that we want that would give representation for the Bay River Watershed, whatever that looks like. Is that okay? She said for the Watershed Council body. Well, I would write a, so the motion would be for me to write a letter on behalf of the Watershed Council that would give 
representation on the Great Salt Lake Watersheds Council to our watershed. And then that could be a, a council, county council kind of a person, or it could be a watershed council person, but that would leave that. I think I think we would we really want to be more specific. Yeah, we would strongly prefer it to be from the watershed council. That's what I think. Okay. At a minimum, someone from the county council or county commission, but strongly prefer it be from the watershed council. Thanks. Based on yeah, because they're not even attending these meetings. Yeah, some of them actually the part, the part. part. Yeah. So sometimes you know we got Talking one, about one of, We got one of the three, right, from the county council. It's big commute for the box over. I know, right? Right? Yeah, I think if we add in that the county county option is a is a viable option for us, but not preferred. I think I will put in. I'll point out Box Elder County has a representative, but Cash and Rich do not. So two thirds of the basin are unrepresented. Yeah, I think that's how I'd phrase it, just so that we. We're just telling Our the clear. county position sucks and we want to see the table. <laughs> well, that's all we'll shoot for. As well as uh, tell them what we're thinking. Okay. So uh the way I hear the motion, is this a motion you're interested I'll in? I'll make making? the motion. Okay. If so I get it right. So Rick and Holmgren making a motion to authorize cash, I mean the Bear River Watershed Council president, me, to if if a bill comes up making the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council the watershed council, mm -hmm. letting me weigh in, write the letter for our council saying that we would like watershed councils represented on that, on whatever that entity, whatever that makeup is. is. I know. <laughs> Is that right? I don't you know. You won't believe how well Chucky and I make motions. I think I've got a few asterisks that, like, where I might need some questions. And, I, and I'll, I'll second that motion. Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> so moved and seconded. Uh, well, all the, one thing I would. Yeah, go ahead you can, comment. You can email, I guess, and I think we can just email and approve it through email. Or maybe we don't need approval with this motion. Just, I think just send it out like your last one. If people yeah. have additional comments, you can incorporate them. If you don't hear back, you send it That's, out. No, I think that idea. no response Every, is a yes vote. Yes. Everyone keep in mind that because the legislature really binding. is only required to give us 24 hours. So, um, quick. yes, if you hear it's happening, just make sure you're checking your email at least twice a day in the morning and in the evening, or else it will just move on through without you. And I always... Uh, and maybe, Sean, you could do this too. When it's from Bear River Watershed Council, I just always put the acronym at the beginning of the subject. Mm -hmm. So. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of Riggins' motion, say aye. And aye. Aye. Online. aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> We're giving plenty of time for those online people. Okay. That's unanimous so that is the majority of the watersheds council because we have a quorum. thank you okay um i'd like to move on to agenda number five item number five so um can i just make one more sure final thing on four yes just wanted to point out out on on uh, HB 280 that it does modify the Watershed Council Act oh. um, and to provide input to the Water Development Coordinating Council, which is going to be the group responsible for prioritizing, not, not maybe not necessarily prioritizing, but, um, well, I, uh, let me just read it. Yeah, it modifies it to say, uh, provide input to the Water Development Coordinating Council regarding infrastructure planning on a watershed and state level in accordance with Part 6 planning and prioritization. So it allows this group the and all and all the other other watershed councils, the group uh, groups to be able to provide that input on what we see as priorities within our watershed for water projects so that they can rank them and prioritize them and decide how that fee funding gets used. Which would vastly in just wanted to point that out. Increase our yeah. 
work though. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Right. Well, but if Tentative. one of our members has a good project, we can write that too. We can be a raw raw. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <a> raw, raw. <laughs> We okay. give them a give them a Harry and send them on their way. <laughs> okay. Anything else on number four before we move on to number five? Okay. Um, Sean included minutes from our December sixth meeting in a two week notification we got in our emails. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. I'll make that motion. Okay. So motion moved by. Nate, second. All seconded. I wasn't in the meeting, but all seconded too. Okay. Mm -hmm. All third. It. We better have him. We better okay. have. Uh, yeah, he was there. Carl. Yeah. Second. Okay, Carl. Second. Spelt. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Minutes are approved from our last meeting. Um, item number six. Again, I just wanted to bring up a discussion and have uh, an agenda topic regarding the letter I sent to Laura Vernon so that it's not under the table. It's all um, above board. Um, I appreciate Val Jay for sending me a copy of the letter that the Farm Bureau submitted in that comment period. It, theirs was much more detailed and pinpointed. Um, I deliberately kept ours very open-ended, but... I did receive uh, an email Friday of last week from the integrated plan committee that said our um, comment was noted and it came within that period. So I think it was a good thing that we did. Um, so thanks to those who gave me a heads up on that. That was not something I was aware of, but anybody want to weigh in on whether they like that or not or I just I think that was great how you went about it emailing out and mm -hmm. we got the chance to provide what input we got in between meetings and I think well it went out scenario. before anybody really had say which was the part that made me very uncomfortable but I think it's great when you start saying each of us should write a letter <laughs> I <laughs> don't want to write a letter <laughs> gotcha okay okay but I will if I have to. Right. <laughs> it, it never hurts to have a outline too, you know. Like I'm I'm a writer and I still appreciate outlines. Um I any comment on number seven, item number seven, discussion of input on the Great Salt Lake integrated plan. The integrated plan is still. Laura, are you still with us? How far out the the work? I sure am. So we're working on a final um, work plan for the integrated plan, and we should have that out by the middle of next month. Um, but we've already started to get to work on some of the technical pieces, the modeling work, and some of the other proposed projects. And we're revising some of the um, projects that were recommended in the work plan based on the comments we've received. So you'll see those kind of final projects that are, will be in the final work plan. But one of the exciting things that I think you guys will be um, will be able to help us with is kind of helping us convene the uh, Bear River Watershed kind of task group for the um, developing the water budget and the water supply and demand modeling that we're doing for the basin. So I'll be back in touch with you about that after the final plan is um, complete. So I'm not sure when your next meeting is, but I'm thinking probably in uh, maybe April or May with some concrete plans. And then I do have another opportunity to do some um, expanding some of the um, outreach efforts to the local communities in your basin. Um, using the watershed councils as um, a convening group for that. So stay tuned. Okay, very good. Keep me informed on that and we'll get you on our agenda whenever that's need needful. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, are there, yeah. oh, go I ahead, say, Mark. Um, 
Trevor and Laura did a very good job on that kickoff meeting that they had that was broadcast for the integrated plan. So mm -hmm. the, the yeah. panel and the presentation I thought was very well done. Just mm -hmm. Comment on that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm very thankful that Trevor was able to join us. I thought that was a great um, discussion and dialogue with the group. And those um, members that were joining at the open house were st um, members of the Basin Plan Steering Committee. So we meet regularly with them um, to talk about this or moving this project forward. So we'll be continuing our discussions. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead. Mark Hurd, go ahead. Mark, hello, Mark. Did he raise his hand, Jenny? Um, there's not go his name, but I don't know what that is. Uh, I didn't, I raised my hand earlier, but I'd made that comment. So apologize if it was left up. Oh, sorry, Mark. It, it's just Jenny and I getting used to what the iconography means. My <laughs> okay. All right. Um, any public comment now would be that time. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to agenda item number nine, scheduling our next meeting. Ideas? Again, we're, uh, remind me, were we trying to, because we talked about this a little bit last time, we were trying to kind of do quarterly meetings? Yes, but except for there this, was some feeling that the legislative session was the... Which is why we met today. Mm -hmm. Um, so we weren't going to do the December meeting, but instead do a January meeting to, so first quarter will have two meetings, second one and fourth quarter won't have a meeting, right? That, that is an idea. We didn't ever change the bylaws, so it's still quarterly. We're close to it. <laughs> <laughs> right? They are going to fire us if we miss one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Get sick math and tree not mute. Huh? It'll all work out. <laughs> so do we want to meet um, exactly. mm -hmm. like prior to the water season starting? So are we looking at March or April? Mar April, because that's in another quarter. Most systems turn on um, between the 15th of April and the 15th of, of May. Oh, May. Oh, May. Water okay. yeah. you so I think that's already said. It's all of the water systems will. Ag yeah. guys are going to be busy getting crops in the ground, but right. Um, and then other people, cities will be busy with with runoff and that kind of stuff. Yeah, er, early early April is probably yeah the best bet of getting people the first two weeks of April. So the Utah Watersheds meets on Thursday, the April fourth. Do we want to meet before, like on Tuesday the second, or it's night? Depends. depends on yeah if you want a report of what comes up at their meeting or not. I think nine, that's my go-to knee-jerk response. <laughs> April 9th? Yeah, April 9th. I guess, are we getting information from them or are we giving information to them? Well, both. So we, we report to them kind of if anything major is going on in our watershed or what we can do, or if we get to the point we have a request, right. then that would flow up through them after our meeting and then we bring information back. So it, it is both, but I don't know that how it's to be this early in the system. We have Todd, do you have a comment? Yeah, um, we are going to add uh, a time period at each Utah Watersheds Council meeting for local councils to bring things that are uh, of importance to that group. Okay. So that'll be an open forum for all the councils, all the local councils to say a few things it'll, it'll be limited in time but then quarterly we're going to have a, a time slotted for each council to do a more formal presentation or formal presentation of the issues or things they'd like the council to bring forward to the governor and the legislature so just giving you a heads up on that that there will be a formal opportunity to do that but at each of the state council meetings there will be an opportunity to, to share important things that you want to communicate okay to know. Thanks, Todd. Well, I say we do it on the ninth. Tuesday, the ninth. Um, that'll be Bear uh, Bear River Preservation meetings. So Bear Lake Watch and the mm -hmm. contract irrigators will be busy because they also do their annual meeting after that. 
Um, so I'm, I'm probably out that day. Okay. And preservation advisory committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Is that about the second? Yes, yeah, April 2nd better. April 2nd? Two, four, two at two. Okay. All right, lots of sounds like a winner. Okay. April 2nd, two o'clock. Do we need a formal motion on that? No, I don't think so. You set the meeting as the chair. Right, that's right. That's what our bylaws say. <laughs> okay, thank you for the reminder. Okay, April 2nd is our next meeting at two o'clock here. Um, virtual will be available as well. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. I know, we just, second. I know we just adjourned, but. <laughs> Go ahead. Did we ever solidify anything about any kind of tour business? Remember we talking? Yeah, you were going to come up. Oh, I was not. Maybe. That's what we decided. <laughs> oh, we did not. I I you were right. I thought that was a unanimous vote. <laughs> you know, to the state watershed. <laughs> yeah, you know, if I said it, y'all better be there then. <laughs> I'll be there. I might fall, but I'll be there. When are we, we're gonna float the United Arrows. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, and I've lived 